Hey, campfire crew, let's get it on. Not Everyone Can Be Trusted by Cucumber Triple X. So this story happened to me and a friend when we were both 12 years old. We went to Switzerland for about five days with our class for a school trip. We were introduced by the team. There were about five, one girl and four boys. They all seemed pretty chill except for one of the boys. Let's name him Nathan, <laughs> not his real name. I don't know why, but I had a bad feeling about that guy. I told my friend about it, but they told me it was probably nothing since I do have a reputation of having trust issues. After that, we were all assigned a room that we all headed to. My room was on the third floor, and hers was on the second one. In each room on the second floor, there was a balcony with a sliding door leading to it. In my room, there was a little window where I could see my friend's balcony out of it. I would usually throw some candy out of it for them to try to catch. I had the candy stock. A couple of days later, in the middle of the night, I couldn't sleep. I had a strange feeling that was keeping me awake, and after some time, I started hearing some noises. So I mindlessly went to look out the window. I looked down to see a human figure standing on my friend's balcony, looking inside their rooms through the glass door. I started yelling at it. Luckily for me, my roommates were heavy sleepers. I was telling it to leave, and it slowly looked up at me and saw that I was looking at it and it jumped off the balcony to run away. The next morning, I went to my friend's room and told her what had happened. She told me that she saw the same figure, but since she does have sleep paralysis, she didn't think much of it at, at the time. I went to the balcony trying to find some footprints or anything that could prove my point, and that something indeed was there that night. And to her surprise, there were some footprints in the snow. We went back inside, and I tried locking the door, but the lock was broken. At that moment, my friend started to freak out, and told me that the sleep paralysis demon was usually inside the room, in the middle of it staring her down, not moving one inch nor looking away to look at the others. We didn't tell the teachers about it because we thought they wouldn't believe us. I mean, we were just twelve, and they were adults. We calmly went back downstairs and pretended nothing was wrong. When the school trip ended, Nathan, the one I had a bad feeling about, asked for everyone's Snapchat to make a group and to keep in touch. He was 24, by the way. We all went to the bus and had to change the bus in the middle of the trip back because we ran into a jeep and two skis pierced into the window, almost killing our driver. At that moment, Nathan looked mad and stressed out, probably because we did just crash, so we didn't think much of it. A couple of months later, my friend asked me for help, saying that Nathan kept sending messages and asking for nude pictures, threatening to come over to her house if she didn't. I suddenly had the thought that the man in the window was Nathan, and they did have the same height and body structure. At that point, we had no clue what to do except to tell her parents. They didn't know what to do because he did have all of her info, so they told her to take a photo of the messages he sent to have evidence that he wasn't a good person. We told the teacher and the principal who asked all the students with Nathan's Snapchat to block him, but of course nobody did. We had enough evidence and told the police about it, and after a month of begging them, they finally brought him to jail. We later learned that another friend of mine had the same problem, and that she refused to do as he asked. The worst part is that he really did show up at her house. I hope to never see or hear of you again, Nathan. Cryptid in the Wild by Trigger1154 I'm an outdoorsman. I'm very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm very familiar and used to wildlife, and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid called a dogman. It charged me and my cousin. It was not a bear. A bear couldn't move how it did. And it was not a normal wolf, as they can't comfortably run on two legs, 
whereas what charged at us seemed natural at doing. This happened around June or July of 2007. I was around 17 years old and more cocky, but still somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in northwest Wisconsin, and I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night it was wise to stay in the cabin, or at least by the bonfire by the beach, because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if we were having a bonfire. The tree line was visible from the fire pit and beach, and at night you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy. That is, until this incident. So this happened somewhere between noon and two o'clock. Me and my cousin were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo, and he was not. I retreated into the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters into about a third of the way up the trail. We'd had enough at that point, and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail talking, and he was maybe 10 feet from me when I decided to mess with him. I shushed him and said, We're being watched. He froze. Then I realized the woods were dead quiet. And I got spooked and started scanning the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right. That's when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect anyone to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf as big as a black bear, at least 300 pounds. But it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, crouching next to a tree with its arm grasping the tree grasping with a clawed hand. It had reddish-brown fur. I told my cousin that we have to go. And the next thing I knew, he was sprinting, and I looked back at this wolf thing that had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet. And then I turned and ran when it looked like this thing was dropping to all fours. It charged us and sounded right on our asses, barreling through the brush but for whatever reason let us go when we broke out of the tree line and headed for the cabin. What stuck with me the most was its sheer size. This wolf thing appeared to be nearly seven feet tall when it was upright, and where it should have had front paws, it appeared to have large clawed hands. I'm not sure how to explain it away rationally. I've heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they can't sprint on two legs. Nor do wolves get that big. And black bears, when they're on two legs, waddle. The closest description is silly, but it was a werewolf or a dogman. Creep at Work, submitted by Anonymous. In my early 20s, I used to work at a very known retail store. I was a cashier at this store in Lexington, Kentucky. I wasn't from the area, and I was a transfer to this specific store, so I was going in blindly after my husband and I moved. I knew no one. Now, I'm not really the type to care if someone is part of the LGBTQ community. It's just not my business. This is important in regards to what happens in my story. I went in one shift and everything was going as planned. Everyone was so nice and inviting. I mean, nothing weird. I thought, okay, great, this could be great for a while. My second shift rolled around and I met another group of cashiers. This is when I met Kyle. She was five foot, balding, wore smeared makeup, men's clothes, and spoke in a forced, high-pitched voice. She seemed to be around 40 or 50 years old. And by the way, Kyle is not the real name of this person. Kyle was claiming to be a trans female. Without me asking, she decided to tell me about her transition. I just nodded and gave her the attention she seemed to be looking for, and I went about my day. I noticed she would make little comments here and there about my hair or my nails or clothes. Nothing to raise red flags. I just thanked her and moved on with my day. Fast forward a week later, and these compliments started to turn into much more. She went from friendly to stalker in less than a whole week. She decided to start touching me. 
Nothing to claim is inappropriate, but I am not the type who enjoys people I don't know putting hands on me. It started with a hand on a shoulder and a pat on the back. Then it started to get super inappropriate. She made sure to rub on me when customers were coming through my line. She would rub my shoulders and I couldn't tell her to stop in front of a customer or be rude. Everyone could tell I was super uncomfortable, yet no one did a thing. When she walked away, customers would ask me if I was okay because I would start to have anxiety attacks after. I just couldn't handle it. Kyle then started following me into the restroom when I would go in. Once I went in as a customer on a day I didn't know she was there. I came out and started to wash my hands. And she looked me up and down and said, I like your boots, in that terrible high-pitched voice with a smile stretched so wide on her face. She was not looking at my boots. She knew what she was doing, and I decided it was time to speak to someone. I told my manager what was going on, and they moved Kyle to another shift in department. I thought all was going to be well. Wrong. Kyle started to come in when I was working and went to speak to everyone around me at their stations, just watching me like the little creep she was. She would come in early for shifts and just hang out. Nothing was done when I reported this to upper management because they were more scared of a lawsuit than my safety. While all of this was going on, I was not allowed to speak to any other associate about what was going on. But I was asking someone about Kyle and if this is typical behavior. To my horror, I found out that Kyle was indeed not a she or transitioning at all. Kyle was actually a male cross-dressing as a woman. He openly told others this and lied to me. They eventually fired Kyle, but not for anything related to this. This whole ordeal has left me traumatized, and I'm almost 30. This happened 10 years ago. I had to leave the city, and I no longer live there. Something Evil Sent to Get Me by Heaven's Door 17 I've never spoken of what happened to me as a child. It took over 40 plus years to utter a word to another human being. This is the first time I typed this out, so please bear with me. It will seem absolutely absurd, and I felt all my life that not another living soul would ever believe me. I mean, how could anyone believe what I have myself questioned now for over 50 years? This happened to me. It's 100% true. It was sometime around 1971, midwinter on Long Island. My parents kept me upstairs in their bedroom as a baby up until I was a toddler, basically until I was old enough to be in a twin bed in my own room. They built their home to specifications back in the 1950s, of course, being who they were. They designed the entire second floor of the house to be their domain. When you reached the top of the stairs, it had a door. You walked into an open room with bookshelves on the entire back wall, and a bench seat sat to your left, sort of like a library area where encyclopedias were kept, and more. Walking through past the wall of books was their bedroom door, and another door to the immediate left was my dad's office. Their bedroom was absolutely huge. When you walked in, their master bath and walk-in closet side were on the right wall, and it was a long wall with a big shelf between the two doorways which held their television set and clock radio. The back wall faced the backyard with a huge picture window in the center. This is exactly where my crib sat, directly in the middle of the window. I remember a lot of moments when I was a baby. I know, it might sound weird, but it's something I retained. I can't remember what I had for lunch today, but I remember many things from my childhood. I literally recall being frustrated not being able to explain things sometimes. I must have been around two or three years old. I would wake up in the very early morning and go underneath the huge shade and look out the window. I can still recall how cold the glass felt to my little fingers and the smell and wetness from the condensation. I would retract my hands from the glass and make handprints. I would play and look at the fog low to the ground, look at the grass, the back shed, and my mother's purple lilacs. I was usually put to bed early. 
I remember this one particular night. The room was dark, and only the moonlight from the window peered into my crib. I was on my back, and something woke me up in the darkness. I could hear glasses clinking and voices coming from downstairs. Loud voices and laughter. I was laid down facing my parents' walk-in closet. The door was usually closed, but this night it was left ajar. I was so little. I was a baby, a toddler, helpless. I awoke and my little eyes opened and the moonbeam peered through the glass as the shade wasn't quite all the way down. I was suddenly afraid, very afraid. I remember this still to this day. I don't understand or know why or how, but I do. Suddenly, a hand appeared out of the darkness. The more it moved towards me, the more the light of the moon exposed this very large, malformed hand. It wasn't normal. It had super long fingers with these wobbly, oversized knuckles. The skin was now what I came to know as the color green. Or maybe the moonlight gave it that appearance. I'll never know. But I was terrified. It moved and I couldn't see anything behind it. Not a body or a face. But I didn't want to see. I was petrified into silence and it moved closer. It had nails with what now I would perceive to be blood all over them because the nails appeared to me in color. What I learned later was red. My mouth moved but nothing came out. Until I finally heard my own voice... I somehow knew I had to scream as loud as I could. I mean, they had to hear me. I was thinking, please hear me, please hurry, now. I didn't know those words. But as a small child, I knew I needed them with the lights on, the door to open, and big people to come help me. This thing drew closer. It couldn't have been more than two feet away at this point. I heard what I now would describe as a low hum like radio waves. No breathing or anything, just this annoying humming sound that bothered my ears. I let out another blood-curdling scream, one between every breath. I crawled as far as I could to get as much distance as I could from this thing. But the bars on my crib stopped me, and I was afraid. I was cornered. I heard the rumbling of something coming up the stairs out there in the hallway. It was still there. I saw this thing clear as day, and I will never, ever not believe that this wasn't real. I mean, it was real. I never needed the light and people so bad in my life. I knew somehow this was bad. This was evil, and if it got to me, I was gone. As soon as the sound of the doorknob twisted, it retracted back into the darkness, and this hand slowly disappeared. It was like slow motion. The lights came on, and it was the first full breath I took that wasn't wailing, and I recall both my parents there. I also remember other people. I guess they had company and were having a good time. Oh well, they never knew what happened to me. Only that I was crying hysterically and pointing at their closet emphatically, and I wouldn't stop. I also wouldn't stay in that room. I clutched on to my father, and I do remember that. I wouldn't let go. I recall them giving each other a look unbeknownst to their friends, and I know this sounds unbelievable, but I knew they got it. They knew something was off. They took me downstairs, and I remember being in the living room with them, and them laying me on the couch. It's a blur after that, but this happened to me, and it was so traumatic that after all these years, I can still recount every single detail. I was no more than three years old. How is this possible? I remember feeling the chill of the glass and the coolness when my tiny arm reached behind me when I was attempting to move backwards in my crib. I know evil exists. I have more experiences, but perhaps another time. I'm grateful, though. Grateful my mother was a very spiritual woman. When my mother had a feeling or a dream, she listened. My father would never speak of such things, but when my mom said something... He paid attention and always listened. He didn't mess with her. He was smart that way. Mom was a special lady. Her sixth sense was uncanny. She never shrugged off something if something happened to me. 
In fact, most of the time she'd react before I could even say anything. I know what I saw was real. I'm 55 years old now, and I still can describe it perfectly. Someone is watching me. Update 3 by Brilliant Bex. I honestly wish I wasn't writing this right now. I've had weeks of peace with only the ping of my overactive camera system alerting me to people passing by with their dogs or children. I thought everything was fine, and maybe this isn't the most dramatic update, but it's just another scary tick mark to add to the list. I got an alert to activity outside the garage. Given my garage door crowbar banger, that's the one I always pay most attention to, honestly. I kept weird hours and hadn't been on my phone, so at first I thought my dad was leaving for work. Then I saw the recording it made later. This man walked boldly up to the car in the driveway, my mom's at the time, and tried the handles of the doors before running off. I called the police with a good description and told them that I had it on video. But my town doesn't have a large police force, and some of them are just like in any department. Shady and lazy. I've rewatched the video so many times now, and he has the same build as the man that I had seen at the garage before. That's obviously not definitive, but now I have more details about his description that I couldn't see before due to lack of lighting and cameras. I'm still pretty shaky, even though he didn't try to get in or anything. I was outside not half an hour ago, though in the fenced backyard. I hope this isn't a lame update. It feels like it to me because still nothing is solved, and even though it might be unrelated, is that actually probable? That one person and or their house would attract so much trouble from completely different individuals? It doesn't seem likely. To the man outside my house tonight, let's never meet. Edit to the edit. This man saw the camera before he ran. I don't know if he would have tried more had he not, but it has little red and blue lights on the front part that rotate in a full circle, so even I've noticed it. It's large and lights up a bit. That's why I thought they deterred the creep so far. I forgot to put that in because I don't think I'm exactly in a great headspace. I was visited by the police who very kindly didn't ring the bell. My parents were asleep and have been texted about all of this. I gave them all the evidence and they'd found the guy. I don't know absolutely sure it was the same man that banged on my garage with the crowbar or watched from my window, but I do know that they caught this guy and my video footage will be used, I guess. I don't know. I was really doubtful they'd actually sent someone due to the chastising text message. Not emergency was closed, Lal, so I called the regular line. And as I'd mentioned that in an earlier post about the incident, my dad had told me there had been a lot of car thefts in the neighborhood. The weirdest part to me, I must be just fucking imagining it, is that he looks, from the somewhat fuzzy camera stills, quite a bit like a guy I had a one-night stand with a couple of months ago, right around when this all started. I really didn't think it could be him, but I'm hoping that since I'm supposed to get this ring footage to the officer tomorrow, I can ask who the person is. I'm hoping it's all over now, and I'm so thankful for those who provided me with great advice, which gave me a lot of comfort. Unless I'm wrong and there is a second person, statistically unlikely, this will be my last update on a thankfully closed chapter. Stalked and Nearly Kidnapped by Temporary Papaya a summer camp my friend and I started to attend in 2019 did surveys every summer based on a topic we would be discussing so we could get better at public speaking and get a more generalized opinion on the topic from others in the area. Me and my friend teamed up with two counselors and hit the town. Our last stop was a Walmart, and we talked to a bunch of different people. The most memorable was the second to last, an older man that asked for our names and all about us after he finished answering our questions. At the time, we were both 13 with hardly any concept of stranger danger, so we gladly answered about ourselves. 
Anyway, a few days later, an account popped up on our friend's requests called Ed Patsice. The account liked a bunch of old posts, commented with a bunch of fire and rose emojis, and called us hot and sexy on our posts. It got to the point where they started to send dick pics. So my friend and I ended up blocking that account. Only a few days later, the account was permanently deleted. It didn't show up in our searches for it. And that's why we thought that was the end of it. <laughs> it was not. When we finally got back to school in August, we had basically forgotten the event altogether. Yet again, this time on both of our Facebook accounts, we got a notice from someone named Ed Patsice wanting to be our friend. We immediately blocked that account again, but not before they had already made lewd comments on my baby pictures, commented on how pretty my baby blonde hair was, and how I looked good in short dresses. After that, we both talked to our parents about the situation, and other than keeping our accounts private, there wasn't really much else we could do. The cops shrugged and said just to take the app down completely. But hey, we were teens. Of course we didn't do that. Over the years, till around the end of 2021, this man kept sending friend requests from different accounts with similar variations of the names, which was a bit stupid, but whatever. Though at the beginning of 2022, that's when it starts to get really creepy. Accounts with the names and pictures of our friends started showing up in our notifications, so obviously we added them thinking it was our friends. We were wrong. Almost immediately, most of our posts had likes or comments on them from this account, and there were multiple DMs of dick pics to both of us. We blocked the account again. This became a recurring cycle. An account with friends' info, pictures, and mutual friends would get hacked, stolen, duplicated, or whatever, just so they could friend us again and again without us worrying too much about it. Finally, it got to the point we stopped adding people from our school at all, even friends. The final time this happened was in summer of 2022. The swarm of fake accounts had stopped roughly two months prior, and seeing as this friend request looked legit by a school friend, I decided to try it out. My friend didn't. She was still wary, but I decided to give it a shot. The compromise was to fully delete our socials and get new ones if this account turned out the same. I was definitely a stupid 17-year-old, but try not to judge me too harshly. This account didn't spam our pictures, didn't DM us dick pics, just interacted with us like any normal school kid would. A like here and there on new posts, a like on a story posted. Never commented on posts. So finally, we thought it was over. <laughs> Wrong. Strange things started to happen and became more of an intentional thing than a coincidence. I would post a picture of me and a friend at the park. A couple minutes later, a white truck pulled up in the lot, eerily close to my car, driver's side door, but we tried not to think too much about it. There were still a few spaces over. Me and my friend were on the swings, basically in a straight line of sight from the parking lot. The truck's lights remained on, pointed at us for a long time. It got to the point that me and my friend finally started getting worried and anxious, so we hopped down from the swings and decided to take laps around the park instead. The truck was far too close to my car for us to be comfortable getting to mine in time. Mind you, it was about 10 p.m. at night, so we were the only ones there. We waited and just roamed around the park for nearly an hour before the truck finally drove away. That's when we raced to my car and I drove home, looking behind me frequently just in case. That happened in early June, and it kept happening. I didn't really notice it. Thought it was a one-off occurrence. It never dawned in my head that it happened after I posted pictures or said where I was with friends. But I started to see a white truck just about anywhere I posted about. Even one that would wait outside my high school when I posted a story about my walk to my mom's store only a mile from school. Again, young and dumb, I didn't think the worst of it. 
I thought it was a parent waiting for a kid. Plus, there were a bunch of people that owned all kinds of variations of white trucks in my town, so I never put much worry into seeing them all the time. My friend never mentioned any white truck, and if we were together, we rarely saw any of them. But I started to get nervous of them after one time I was walking to my mom's store. I decided to take a glance at the driver of the truck that sat near the car line every day after school. It was the same man from our Walmart survey trip, if not a bit older. The one back in 2019. It was bizarre, definitely. We were never expecting to see him again, especially since we met him in a few towns over from our town. Yet, lo and behold, he was right there. That's when I walked, probably ran actually, to my mom's store. This kept happening, and I finally knew I was being stalked after seeing him that first time because I saw him everywhere on foot. This post is getting long, so I'll fast forward to the last bit that happened on the last day of our shared summer camp in late July 2023. At that point, I was still 17, and since I was older than most of the new campers, I might as well have been considered a staff member. I drove kids to camp and home every night, and they paid me for gas money, so I was cool with doing it. It didn't bother me, since they were in the same town as me, and there were others farther away the counselors typically drove home. That day, I posted all the pictures of the last day and the last campfire right before I left so I could try and save my phone that was suffering from glitches, lack of data, and it didn't let me communicate or call others because my storage was full. So I photo-dumped a bunch of stuff, but it didn't fix the problem. My phone was essentially broken. It hardly worked, and I bought my current phone after this occurrence. On top of it, one of the older campers that visited on the last day, a 19-year-old male, didn't have a phone either, but he was also in the car with me. In the back seat, I had three campers. One didn't have a phone either, and the other two were dead. One camper had a phone charging in my carport, but we didn't think much of that. We just turned on the radio full blast and gunned it back home. As I pulled off the back road of our camp up to the intersection, the light turned green and we went forward. In the lane next to us was a white truck that kept turning its brights on and off. It was a bit weird, so I sped up, and again, I didn't think much of it. Side note, my best friend, let's call her Anne for this, has a baby. Anne had her kid at 16, so at that point her kid was nearly a year old. Still very fussy on car rides and such. This becomes important later, because Anne was there for the last day of camp, too. She left right before we did when her baby became cranky. Eventually, I didn't see the white truck behind me anymore, and I slowed down a bit. It was nearly 9.30 at that point, late enough for the highway between our towns to be essentially empty. There's this back road that is a bit curvy that leads close to my house and directly to a rich neighborhood. It's a street I typically take to get back to my house from camp if I had no one to take home, and everyone that was a regular in my car called it the detour. It was quite pretty, with a bunch of full evergreen trees and wildlife. The kids, not really kids, but they acted like it, were a 13-year-old female, a 15-year-old male, and another 15-year-old male. They were in the back and were begging me to go on the detour since it was the last day of camp. So I caved in and hit my blinker, turning right onto the back road. Now, listen, I'm not the safest person out there, don't judge me. I'm still basically a kid, too. But all the ones in the back love to hang out the windows on the back road. So I let them stick their heads out of the sunroof, sit on the windowsill while holding the bars on top of my car. I went slow, under 10 miles an hour, just so they could do it and not worry about them getting hurt. I mean, there was no one on the back roads. Cops never camped out on these streets, and I was going under the speed limit by like 20, so there really wasn't any harm in letting them stick out the windows. Eventually, I let them bully me into taking them around the rich neighborhoods that had cool water fountains and covered bridges on their streets. Apparently, one of the covered bridges caved in, so we had to go around this on a super narrow street right next to a large drainage ditch about 15 or 20 feet deep. As we were going around it, 
a car came up behind us. I assumed it was one of the people who lived in the neighborhood, so I was just going to speed up and let them get to their house. Finally, we came to the four-way of the rich people street. Straightforward was a dead end, which was what I was originally going to head towards. To the left was the broken covered bridge, and to the right was a back around about that would take us back to the beginning of the street. It had no houses or lights back there because the neighborhood was still being built. Jake, the 19-year-old male, told me to go right. Mind you, one of the campers was sticking their body out of my skylight from the back seat, so I couldn't see out of my rearview mirror. I didn't really want to, but I trusted Jake's instincts and turned right. As soon as I did, I started to hear honking behind me. I was a bit startled, and so were the kids in the back seat. I glanced out in my side view mirrors, but I couldn't see anything past bright LED lights. I thought it was just because I took too long, so I sped up a bit after I turned right. There was a hook at the end of a hill on this back street, and it makes you tug the steering wheel pretty hard to stay on the road, especially in the dark. The car behind me turned right too. They started flashing their LED brights honking loudly and had rolled down the windows screaming at us. They kept trying to get in the lane next to us and bump into my car to run us off the road. And that's when I knew this was serious. Instantly, I started screaming at the kids in the back seat to sit down, buckle up, and roll up the windows. They barely managed to do that by the time I hit the bend at the end of the hill really hard and gunned it off the street driving around the drainage ditch with little problem. I'd done it multiple times. There was no phone in the car to call anyone, least of all the police, so I just ended up speeding down the back streets as the car behind chased me, trying to run me off the road multiple times. When we came up on sharp corners, they slowed down. That told me they didn't know the area well, which I used to my advantage. As I was approaching a stop sign, for me to go left or right, my house was to the right, so left it was, I yelled at Jake to check my right because I wasn't stopping for the sign. I sped past it, and the car, this is about the time I noticed it was a fucking white truck, tried to hit my bumper again, and I swerved into someone's yard. Grass was damaged the next day when I drove past it. I booked it down the street, hitting every turn as fast as possible, and eventually I thought I lost the truck. I sped past my high school and onto the highway again where we all got off in the first place. I didn't see the truck behind us, but we were all still freaked out. I took a right to go on to another main way and passed by a gas station on the way. That's very important in a moment. So I stopped at the gas station and handed the kids in the back some cash for them to go get themselves a drink and a snack to help them calm down. None of them were crying, thank God. The adrenaline junkies they were. They thought it was more exciting than anything. I told Jake to go watch them in the store and make sure that they didn't do anything stupid while I filled up my gas tank. We waited at the gas station for about 20 minutes before I went back onto the road to take them home, just in case. I asked them if they had seen the car at all while they were hanging out the windows, and only one of them said that they thought they did, but the truck's lights were off. It was the same truck from a town or so over from the intersection in front of the back road to our camp. They followed us for nearly 25 minutes. After I dropped all of the kids off, I was still a bit shaky and decided to try and see if my phone would call someone that I could talk to about what happened. The only contact that would load was Anne, since she was the last person I had talked to on our phones. With a stroke of luck, my phone actually let me call. She picked up, but all I could hear from her side of the line was her crying. Obviously panicking, I asked her what was wrong, and lo and behold, she shared a story eerily similar to what had just happened to me. Apparently, Anne's baby started crying so loud she could barely focus on the road. So she pulled into the gas station I mentioned earlier, right outside her high school that I had sped past. She was giving her kid their bottle when a white truck pulled into the lot. Immediately, she was wary because the station was closed. 
she was right to be wary. Less than 30 seconds later, this truck parked horizontally in front of Anne's car to block her in. She immediately started her car again, locked the doors, and pulled over off the grass curb, blocking her from the street. She was not changing her baby at all. Anne told me the only thing she remembered was the man that we had seen years ago in that Walmart, his eyes staring at her like she was just a piece of meat for him to have. As she raced home, the truck caught up to her. She turned on her back road, running out of gas, and the truck started to flash its lights, honk, run her off the road the entire time. But a couple of streets before hers, a little red car pulled out in front of her and started to brake check her as the white truck tried to hit her from behind. It was a mess. She took a chance, sped up, and swung onto her street to at least lose the red car. The truck booked it after her. Apparently, both of her older brothers were waiting outside for her with some of their friends to help her bring her stuff in with the baby. Upon seeing this as she pulled into her driveway, the white truck sped off. If her brothers hadn't been outside, there might have been a different story. Anyway, long story short, the truck that followed me all the way back had an accomplice in a red car that followed my friend Anne. When they couldn't catch me, they went for her. Both me and Jake suspected that because I didn't go on to the dead end where the old man could cut me off. It's probably why things got so violent so quickly. I never mentioned what happened after this, but the man in the white truck and the other in the little red car were found at town over where there was footage taking of them attempting to kidnap a seven-year-old off a porch and being attacked by his dog. Along with this, we found out that there had been several sightings of a white truck around our town following others doing similar things days after it first happened to us, you know, following cars that had similar description to my friend's car and mine. Our reports were officially filed after we saw the information of the car on Facebook, along with the identity of the man that had stalked us for years. It took years to get rid of them, but now we don't have to worry about the men anymore. Deep Sea Expedition Encounter by I Am Slav The story is not mine, but my uncle's. I will clarify that while I believe this story to be true, there is a lot of room for speculation. I'll start off with some background information. My uncle has been a marine biologist for the past 50 years. He's now in his 60s and has spent the last 25 years teaching marine biology at a university. His area of expertise has been the North and Mid-Atlantic Ocean. Growing up, every time we would visit him in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, he would tell us countless stories of the numerous deep-sea expeditions he participated in. Prior to his teaching years, he was primarily a researcher. Every single story was interesting and filled with wonder. The story I'm about to tell is the only one that has me questioning what is really out there in the deep ocean. For the sake of this story, I'll refer to my uncle as Uncle Jay, or just Jay, to keep some semblance of anonymity. The story begins when Uncle Jay was getting ready to embark on an upcoming expedition to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The research vessel they would be traveling on was a medium-sized vessel, around 80 meters long. One of those ships that had a crane, and it was crewed by maybe 20 men, and there were about 15 marine biologists of various specialties attending. It was early summer, sometime in the late 90s. I'm unsure of the exact date, and Uncle Jay was about 30 at the time. He said they couldn't have had a better day for loading the vessel. The ocean was calm, and the weather was beautiful. They would be out at sea for the next month and a half, and all weather forecasts looked promising. Once the ship was loaded, they embarked on their journey. It took them approximately a week to reach the ridge. The primary goal of this expedition was to examine and possibly identify new species of sea life in that region. Additionally, they wanted to examine how known species lived. They didn't have any submarines, so in order to find any new species, they had an intriguing plan. Using the crane on board, they attached cow carcasses to the hook and lowered them into the water near the ocean floor. 
a few feet away from the hook were multiple cameras and lights to observe any sea life that might devour the carcass. Uncle Jay said they had about ten carcasses. They kept them locked in a cold storage unit. They would begin their journey in the northern portion, lower the carcasses into the water for a few days, and move south along the ridge, repeating this process. When the carcasses were lowered, the ship would power down all engines and simply drift. If they drifted away from the ridge, they would power up and very slowly move back into position. Because this was a rather low-budget mission, the cameras on the hook didn't provide a live feed, and all footage was thoroughly examined afterwards. There was about 48 hours of footage they had to sift through after each time they pulled the hook back up. They'd been at it for about a week and had not made any new discoveries, but did gain valuable footage of rarely seen sea life consuming the cows. At this point in the story, Uncle Jay said everything was going according to plan. The seas were calm and everyone on board was enjoying their time. They were onto their fifth cow carcass and it was about 5 p.m. when they hooked it up and lowered it into the water. This portion of the ridge they were at was about 3,500 meters deep and was pushing the limit of how much cable they had on the crane. Now for this mission, two of the marine biologists were required to monitor the crane and their location in relation to the ridge at all times. My uncle and another biologist drew the short straw and had to watch overnight. They would swap out around 9 a.m. Uncle Jay said it was an uneventful night, and him and the other biologists chatted all night and bounced different theories off each other. Around 7 a.m., just as the sun was rising, all was calm. Almost too calm, Jay remarked. They hadn't drifted off course throughout the night, and the ocean was like glass. Much of the crew was beginning to rise as well. But what happened next was a complete shock to everyone on board. It's important to note that the crane had been angled off the right side of the ship. All of a sudden, and very rapidly, the 80-meter-long vessel began listing to the right side. It was almost as if something grabbed the hook and began pulling it deeper. My uncle said the immediate panic he felt was unlike anything he'd experienced. He said it felt like the ship was going to capsize. They immediately sounded the ship's onboard alarm system to notify the crew of an emergency. Once they had their faculties in order after their initial shock, my uncle ordered the other biologist to begin reeling in the crane. Since the cabling was so long, it would take about 20 minutes to completely reel in the line. The other biologist began to reel in the crane, but the winch was struggling, and the ship was leaning more and more into the water. My uncle said that just as the water began to pour over the right side of the ship, it smacked back down and into an upright position, and he was sent flying into some containers. Most of the crew had come out now as well. There were several injured on board, but nothing life-threatening. Over the next 20 minutes, as the crane was still retracting the line, the crew assessed their injured and any damages to the ship. My uncle was ultimately uninjured, despite being thrown around and he said waiting for the line to come up was the longest 20 minutes of his life. Everyone was in complete shock as to what had just happened. Two minutes of complete chaos, and now again all was calm. When the crane returned to the surface, the cow carcass was completely gone, and the large metal hook was slightly bent. A few of the cameras were missing, but thankfully not all of them. The cow carcass being completely gone was the most interesting part, as every other case it was never gone completely. The vessel's captain made the decision to head back shortly after this incident, much to the disappointment of the biologists, including my uncle. He wanted to figure out what could have caused that. However, several onboard generators were damaged in the impact, and they were essential to the ship's operation, so they had to return. My uncle believed it was because the captain and the ship's crew were terrified, and rightfully so. On the week-long journey back, the biologist examined the footage to try to identify what caused this. The footage, by all accounts, was normal. There was the carcass, about 10 meters off the sea floor, illuminated by floodlights. Some small shrimp-like sea life was feasting on the cow, when all of a sudden, the cameras went black. 
not as if they stopped recording, but something was covering them. The timestamp showed it was the correct time of the incident. After two minutes, the lights came back, and they could see again. It wasn't much, though, as an enormous amount of sediment was kicked up from the ocean floor and now enveloped the view of the cameras. While they were able to rule out the hook getting snagged on the bottom, they were never able to see what caused this. And that's how the story ended. No answer or explanation. That was it. They returned to port and reported their findings, but to my knowledge, nothing ever came of it. My uncle has his theories for what could have caused this, ranging from a hungry sperm whale to a giant squid to some other unknown massive sea creature. Whatever it was must have been huge in order to devour a complete cow carcass in under two minutes and nearly capsize an 80-meter research vessel. While this story is outlandish and hard to believe, I have no reason to disagree with it. My uncle has never told any story that was similar to this. This is the only one that comes close to sea monsters and the unknown. But whether you believe it or not, it makes you think what really could be out there lurking in the deep ocean. Maybe My Ex by Alternate Status 664 This is a French story, so don't be rude about my English, please. A few years ago, I was in a relationship with a guy, James, for three years. He's a male and 20 years old. In the beginning, he was wonderful. He supported me during my chemotherapy, was kind and funny, a bit crazy, but not in a creepy way. He helped me survive through my sickness, and I wouldn't be alive without him right now. The last year of our relationship, he changed. He wanted to try new experiences and began taking drugs. I didn't know he was an addict until our breakup. He was totally different. Jealous, a liar sometimes wicked with me, and he cheated on me before our breakup. To be honest, I had pity for him. So after the breakup, I'd spent six months helping him. I was a student, and he was always at my home, in pain, trying to fight his addiction. I said stop, when after a month in an institute, he started doing drugs again like three hours after leaving. Sad story. But it got worse. During our relationship, I chose my university to be close to him, so I had nobody around. No friends, no family. One month after cutting the rope, something strange happened. Everything began with my cat. One night, I went to see a movie. On my way home, it started raining, and I remembered that I left my cat outside. He's a really nice cat, but he hates water, like every cat, I guess. I started running to be home early, and when I opened the door, my cat was on my sofa. First I thought, what a dumbass, the cat wasn't outside at all. But then I hugged him, and my cat was completely wet. It felt weird. I was like, WTF? And then I thought my neighbors could have opened my door to let him in. So I just forgot about it. One week later... I realized that some of my clothes were missing, particularly my underwear. I've got ADHD, so I blamed myself for losing my own clothes. But the same with my food and some plates, like one of my favorite bowls disappeared. It was a studio apartment, so not big enough to lose that many things. But again, I blamed myself. I even called myself a magician, joking about how I could make everything disappear without even trying. I lost my mind when I came back from my parents' house and discovered my place had totally changed. There was the neighbor's mail on my table with mysterious headphones. My photos on the wall were upside down, and a black umbrella was on my bed. I didn't own an umbrella. It was scary as fuck. I called my mom and then the police. Yes, always mom first. The officer was nice, but told me that there was nothing they could do except take my complaint. I didn't know who was doing this to me. My ex never had my keys, and even when I said that I didn't want to talk to him anymore, 
I stayed nice with him. I didn't think anybody wanted to hurt me or just wanted to scare me. I mean, for what? Joking? If that's it, haha, <laughs> hilarious. I slept with a knife for two years. Congratulations. My neighbors started getting scared too. We had a common basement and someone broke the door during the night. We found some supplies in it, like a blanket and a plate. Not one of my plates, by the way. I had chains on the inside of my door, so I felt secure when I was inside. But I was scared to leave and come back to see my stuff missing again. A few weeks went by. In the evening, I had to go to the grocery store, and it took me like 30 minutes. When I came back home, there was a note on my bedroom mirror. Nothing written, just a smiley face. It freaked me out, and I left immediately. Again, calling the police, they told me that I could have left the note and then forgotten about it. I didn't have that kind of little sticky yellow paper, so I don't see how. I stayed with my mom for a week, spent all my savings on a camera, and posted for help on social media because I felt totally distraught. And after that, nothing. In the meantime, James's sister came to talk to me, saying that one of my favorite jackets was at their parents' house. I remembered wearing this jacket after saying stop to James, so again, I've got ADHD. I might have forgotten. But I hadn't seen James's parents for like eight months at that time, so I found it kind of difficult to believe. Also, I suspected my neighbor who had one of my keys was feeding my cat when I wasn't home. But she was in another country during most of this story. So? I talked with James last year about it. And he swore he had never done anything that weird and told me he was in another cure center when all that shit happened. Everything stopped after that. I still don't know who did this or why. Maybe my ex? Maybe someone else? No, I really don't care. But this is the creepiest story I've lived. To my stalker, let's not meet again. Uncle Josh note here, I've known more than a few addicts, and I gotta be honest with you, this sounds like addict behavior, especially the breaking into the basement with some blankets and some plates. I hate to say it was James, and I certainly don't know, but OP? It sounds like James. Anyway, good luck to you. I hope you stay safe. And I hope all of this stops for the rest of your life. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. If you have a true scary story of any nature that you'd like to hear narrated on this channel or my podcast, email it to UncleJoshTrueScaryStories at gmail.com. I read them all like to take a second to really give a special thanks to everyone who does listen to this. I've just gone over 23,000 subscribers. I've got about 2.8 million views on YouTube and close to 2 million downloads on the podcast. So, man, I can't thank you guys enough. Your support has been amazing and I hope to continue to bring you great content. But again, I do rely on you. Send me what you've got from the bottom of my heart. Thanks. If you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel, share it with your friends, and of course, follow me on social media, links to that are in the description below. And if you'd like to take your support a step further, there's a link to my Patreon page, as well as my storefront on tpublic.com. Get yourself some Campfire Crew merchandise. Thanks again for your support. It's you guys that make this go. I'm just a voice in the night. Everyone. Be excellent to each other. And until next time, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door.